Welcome back to Heart to Heart with me, Shakti Sundari. Today we're in the heart of the Gloucestershire countryside and we're just about to meet an amazing sacred musician, Craig Cruz. Craig is um, a composer, a producer, he's been BAFTA and Grammy Award nominated, he's produced and composed music for films such as Bend It Like Beckham, he's worked with outstanding musicians like Sir Cliff Richard, and of course, for me, the one most touching thing is that he created and produced The Sacred Chance of Devi, which I love so much and use in my own work. So I'm super excited to meet and speak with you, Craig. Welcome. Very nice to be here. Thank you for coming. Yeah. 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 How many instruments do you play, Craig? <laughs> uh, I play the radio. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say... It's better to start what I don't play, because I, I'm really in awe of violin players mm. And, mm. and also flute players and sax players. I'm a trained brass player, so I can play the brass instruments, the trumpet. I used to play trombone. Uh, and through sitar and my love of stringed instruments, I, of course, I branched into guitars. Mm. Uh, but uh, my real classical training is trumpet piano okay. and percussion. I can write classical percussion scores. And, that's helped me with film music, of course, and conducting orchestras. Yeah. Of all the things that you've composed, this is a really tricky question, but what's the favorite, your favorite piece? Of meditation music? Anything that you have composed, do you have a favorite piece or a favorite composition that you did for, them, for a movie? Or um, I guess that they're different genres of what you've created, aren't there? So maybe that's too much to, <laughs> to span, but... Um, so if we take something from the, the more commercial type. Yes, yes. Um, okay, yeah. In like fact, some, something's popped into my mind, which mm. seems to get both camps. Mm. Uh, but uh, when I started working with the Ganda Boys, um, my African group, mm -hmm. and my two gentlemen are wonderful, inspirational singers, activists, and we had a lot of conversations what it's like in Uganda. And I started traveling to Uganda. We started a charitable foundation called the Ganda Foundation in Uganda. And when I started seeing the social conditions, I, I really became motivated that we could use our, our fame, we're very loved in Uganda as the Ganda boys, uh, to harness that to do programs for hospitals and schools. And so we started doing that. But of course, in, you, a lot of people don't know this. Uganda is the second largest refugee harboring country in the world. They have refugees from South Sudan, civil war in South Sudan, Rwanda, Burundi, from the Congo, and also from the, the dire um, drought that's happened in northern Kenya. And they welcome all these people. They give them land. Such an incredible thing. Mm -hmm. And then when it started happening in Europe, in fact, six months before it started happening in Europe, we had a conversation in my studio about what it must be like to be a refugee. What, what, what is it like? We're, we're parents. You, you know, Prem, yourself, and I, we, we're parents. We know what it's like to nurture children and to have children. What is it like to have to leave your ancestral homes? So I started playing the piano, these rippling piano chords, and the words came on a dusty road with a heavy load, counting down the days since our people betrayed. Child, oh child, I want to go home. Cries, I want to go home. No mommy, no daddy, lying still by the side of the road. And then the Ganda boy sang, The Forgotten People, and then The Forgotten People as the chorus. And we recorded that, and it was adopted uh, uh, and acknowledged in, by Grammy artists. We had 21 Grammy artists come and sing on it. We went to Munich and put the Syrian Refugee Orchestra on it. And African drummers fresh off the boats came and played on it. So you can find it online. It's called The Forgotten People.
forgotten For all the days that are gone Can't feel the longing or pain When your arms cannot carry on The forgotten people When will we know The forgotten people And never, never, ever come home Dusty road with a heavy load, counting down the days since the people betrayed. Child, oh child, cries, I wanna go home. No mommy, no daddy, lying still by the side of the road. The forgotten people. So this piece of music, is it um, to raise funds yes. for a charitable project? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And we're working with UCLA to try to package uh, educational packages to reach. We found out that the refugees around Europe were navigating through uh, smartphones and tablets and social media to try to find out communities that would accept them. So we thought, well, why don't we deliver packages for job retraining, uh, social etiquette, and all the things that could help them to resettle in different communities. So that's been one of the objectives of the Forgotten People oh. campaign. But the fact that we had the 21 Grammy artists all come in for the love of it and sing on it and play on it, including Mickey Stevenson, the original founder and our legend of Motown Records came and he sang on it. And he's taken a big interest. He stood up at some big corporate meetings with Klaus Nobel, the senior member of the Nobel Prize family, and said, this is the, what we tried to do with Motown and really to get people to see, and now it's coming from Africa. So Stevie Wonder said to my gentleman, they said that this is how we should do it all the time. These campaigns are coming from wealthy white pop stars it should be coming from the africans themselves mm. and so this this that song and that inspiration to see the ripple effect that that had for me has been yeah very very special so that's why i picked that song out to mm. answer your question Amazing story. Yeah, yeah. i wonder if um because you also make so much sacred music and that's how i came to know about you myself really um is from, from all your learning, is there something qualitatively different that um, the, the resonance of a certain type of music, do certain sounds have an impact on the listener in the sense of awakening the soul? That's a very good question. Yes. I would say uh, definitely yes, yes. And then also yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's, it's a very deep subject. And... Um, it not only goes into the temperament of tones, uh, overtones. Mm -hmm. My sitar teacher, uh, Indrajit Banerjee, I'm so grateful to him. He used to play his sitar and hit these low notes between the black and white notes of, of, of a piano, just right. And he hit it and massage it. And then this 18th harmonic would appear like a whistle, very high. I said, how did you do that? That's just, he said, we understand about harmonics. Harmonics are all in nature. Every time you pluck a string, there you have the fundamental wave and then first, second harmonic, third harmonic. But to get into the high harmonics, you need acoustic instruments. You can't do it with synthesizers and electronic music. I moved away. The irony is I came to London in 1973 as a synthesizer programmer with a lot of skills that got me a lot of work and got me right up into the business. But I moved away more I realized about the power of harmonics. The early synthesizers chopped all the harmonics off. In fact, we pay a piano tuner so much money to put all 12 keys out of tune. So you can play your, your, your Bach, your Mozart, your Beatles songs, show tunes. But you are putting those perfect frequencies out of tune. So with Indian classical music, you don't do that. 
the perfect temperament is very penetrating on the cells in the body. Mm -hmm. Of course, the consciousness too. Yeah. But if you start on the different levels, why, how does music affect you? Physically, emotionally, mentally, and then transcendentally. So absolutely, to explain your question, we could probably be here about 30 minutes. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> because the thing is that sound is such an amazing science. Mm -hmm. And you could even go, Sufi Inyat Khan said that, our, that sound is actually what creates everything. Yeah. Well, in a way, with your, your practice, your sadhana is about sound. Of course. Right. Right. Yeah. right. And the, you used the word re resonance mm -hmm. before. And resonance is a very good word because there's entrainment, there's resonance, there's that whole thing of, of how do you awaken. You see, some, someone comes to the doctor, they're ill. Some part of their body has fallen asleep. And if, how do you awaken all those cells so that every cell of your body feels alive and full of love and full of belongingness? This is the start of perfect health. So music has a big role to play with that, you know. And for many cultures and many centuries, the families have gotten together to sing under the stars, to be close. And the toning that have been used by many cultures, they know the effect of this. The Vedic culture is probably the best conduit of most sophisticated uh, subjective science. We call it Vedic science. Mm -hmm. And the music of Vedic science is not surprising. It's just extremely deep. And that science can permeate and inform all the rest of musical knowledge. There's no problem. And I've been working on this, doing Indian music for, for Massive Attack, Def, Def Leppard, Manic Street Preachers, bringing it into the mainstream, because the science is not just Indian. Right. Vedic science is not Indian. My music teacher pushed me to play in public. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm a student. He said, no, no, we, other people need to hear that you can play this music because it's universal music. But it, it holds principles, techniques, understanding that are so deep and have been lost that our culture is slowly growing up, waking up to, mm -hmm. and using. Mm -hmm. It's a very exciting time to be alive in that way. Mm -hmm. And that we can dedicate music for waking people up in all the different ways. Not just in one way, not just meditation CDs. Exactly. Yeah. So tell us, what are you working on right now? What's right. The, what's the exciting oh, I, thing I going get, on right now? Okay, you got yeah. another 20 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I've done this white lion attunements, okay? And this is basically that we, many people have always been aware that they're, uh, they're beings that help us. You know, met, some people call them guardian angels. So, uh, and it's, uh, of course, it's associated with the New Age movement a lot. But I've had direct experience of the knowledge of higher masters, maybe not even of this earth, and using those principles in music. I was very gifted in the 70s to get a download of the meaning of the different tones and intervals and what they mean on the esoteric sense. Rudolf Steiner worked with that. There are other, other composers that, that had access to this. And uh, so I wanted to make a CD that resonated with, with all those qualities, that people that are, were sensitive and felt that they weren't in touch, were in touch with other realms, could put mm -hmm. the CD on and experience that. So this new one is called Light Language Attunements. And it's uh, by myself, and I've met a, a wonderful, beautiful, attuned lady who just goes into a trance and sings. And her name is Carmen Bell White. So we, we've released this CD. We're getting amazing reviews all around the world. It's something very different. I use all the perfect temperaments so on my knowledge of Indian classical, but I'm using crystal bowls. I'm using uh, these very fine Indian stringed instruments and breath and nothing else. So basically creating soundscapes that you can sit deep in meditation to feel all this activation. So it's almost like DNA activation in the body.
this is this is uh, pretty much informing me at the moment. I went with 22 sound healers and goddesses down to uh, the sacred places of the Cathar in France. Uh, and we were recording in the Galimus Caves, René Le Chateau, mm -hmm. the places of Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're releasing an album called The Magdalene Codes. Oh, I can't wait to, that, I can't that, wait to. <laughs> That's coming out. And I'm uh, very happy to be working with Stella Fairburn, mm -hmm. who's an Irish singer. And she has very good mastery of also the light language. So, this this is coming up more and more with three singers now that I'm working with light language. That you remember the galactic languages. This Earth is a very small place in the cosmos. Um, for somebody who's watching this who doesn't know what light language is. Yes, yes. So light language is. Some people can sing in the ancient Gaelic spontaneously. Some people can sing in the Sanskrit sounds. And other people receive other sounds. Okay? And there are other sounds like prim primordial sounds, they could say, of Gaia, Earth. Mm -hmm. And then there's some that can sing the sounds of uh, nature spirits, the devas or nature spirits. And then there's some that tune in, in, into the more planetary uh, devas. Uh, in Sanskrit, it's called the Mahadevas. Mahadevas. And then there's some that, uh, that tune into the galactic uh, uh, Davis, and then that expresses and comes through. And it's very beautiful and very penetrating. It seems when you hear it that it sounds familiar, and yet it isn't coded in our language. But, you know, we've had the blind, blindfolds on for so long, and they're slowly coming off, and, and people are seeing the world in a different way. to ask you this um, because when we first got here we were talking about crop circles so I do need to ask you about that because you've had a fascination with crop circles yes. for about 15 years yes I, I've been vi visiting them for 16 17, 16 years. Yeah. years yeah yeah so um, just very briefly what are they from your perspective what right. is their importance right so cro crop circles yes it's a very controversial subject probably because of a lot of meddling by, by media and forces that don't want us to really uh, go deeply into the subject, which is unfortunate. But uh, be that as it is, uh, crop circles themselves are a harmonic phenomena. They're expressing in the fields uh, a, a lot of sacred geometry and harmonics that exist in music. And I, when I saw them, I immediately was drawn to them for that reason. And I'm also drawn to sacred art that embodies a lot of the qualities of music as well. I always have been. Now, I saw this on a big scale in a field. My first crop circle that I went to uh, had such an incredible impact on me because it was so big. And I talked to the farmer. It's only four or five hours uh, darkness at that time. There was someone camping in the field next door. This thing appeared, this is August 2001, yeah. half a mile across, 400 31 circles, perfectly made, and a military hel helicopter was hovering overhead when I went. This is the day after it formed. And uh, it's called the Milk Hill Formation. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a six-armed galaxy and very complicated mathematical set. It's like a, a multiple Julia set, they call in mathematics. I had a good, careful look around the field, saw no footmarks, no surveying equipment, talked to the farmer. The only road that could come up to that part of the, of the landscape up on Milk Hill had to go right past his bedroom. He would have heard if any mm. guys with boards had come, come in. And, uh, you know, it, it's, and so I satisfied myself that, that it was not interference. It's, these are not man-made. No way could they be man-made. Mm. And it's, the phenomena has attempted to be debunked by saying that these are very clever people with boards coming out. I, I don't buy that at all. So the next thing was, okay, 
wow, what is this? And I started researching books. I went to the Crop Circle Conference every year. 2004, NASA scientists made uh, their research known that they'd been taking soil samples and they concluded there was some technology we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. But the themes of each year change. So whether it's Earth intelligence, whether it's Agartha, inner Earth civilizations, or whether it's, uh, it's uh, civilizations on different dimension that are encoding in us, in our mind, uh, these effects. But I would say that those crop circles went, were right at the time that I made Davy Prayer. Uh, that's a piece of music that you resonate with. Very much. Yeah. And I used to have experience of timelessness sitting and meditating in the crop circles. And the way I constructed Davy Prayer, she would chant one of the lines of the Davy Prayer and I would take all the layers away, like I experienced in crop circles. And it would be left with nothing. And then she would chant another phrase. And if you ever listen to it again, you will now notice. That, but no one's aware of it. All they realize that this chanting is happening, it just goes into space. But the space is actually by taking away layers and it's like a crop circle. You basically, you're, you're left with the patterns of vibration and harmonics that are in the fabric of our cells and all our, all our um, manifest creation. So it's, it has gone deep into my awareness and really, it, I first became a, a, aware of the phenomena right at the time the sacred chants of Shiva went viral all over India. And that, that was something that I was totally unexpected. I, I wasn't prepared for, actually. In fact, you know, I had recorded my dear teacher's uh, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, founder of the Art of Living. I would recorded his sister in my studio. And he had heard some of the, the, the music, and he said in Hindi to a lady, he said, this will be known all around the world. And it was only years later did I find out what he thought. And I, I thought, well, maybe he didn't want me to be attached to that result. Mm -hmm. But I, and I, again, I didn't know there was any market for this kind of music. But Times Music took it up, Times of India. Right those years that I was imbibing the energy of crop circles, I was creating the Sacred Chance series. There's it's that. like a transmission. Of yes. Intelligence that's beyond. Precisely. I think so too. And I think that there has been a good case that when you understand sacred geometry and get into the shapes, that you are maturing, fine honing your, your higher body, you call it the light body. And there's, there's now talk about Merkaba and the ways that you can learn. There are many people that are trained that they can take their astral body and visit people. You know, I, I haven't done that training, but I'm aware that all these things are, pro are possible. So if we get encoded messages visually, and there's a long tradition in the Vedas with Sri Yantras and other encoding of the consciousness through form, yeah. that of course through music it's even more powerful. The last sense that leaves you when you die is hearing. It's the most connected with consciousness, hearing. Your sense of hearing is the most deeply connected to your consciousness. This is why sound is so powerful. Just one thing, when you mentioned the harmonics of the crop circles then, immediately I was thinking, do you look at a crop circle and hear it? It's a lifetime ambition of mine to, to be able to be given the time and the budget that I could stop all my other work and, and do dedicate composing for three, four days on one crop circle yeah. and make a suite yeah. of pieces that I have composed based on my choice of crop circles. Yeah. Embody the form, embody the numbers, and then whatever it speaks to me of that mm -hmm. crop circle is then express it in music. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, that is, a, that is a lifetime dream to do. Mm -hmm. I, I really hope that I can fulfill it. Mm. I, I would love to. And I have thought many, many times of that. You know, you get very busy in life. <laughs> so many things going on and you collaborate. And, but this is something I'd like to do for myself. People say to me, why aren't you producing more of your own albums of creative stuff that's in there? And I say, well, it's coming. Mm. Well, may it be so. Oh, thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. Craig, it's just been fascinating. We could talk forever. It's time I've, to draw the I it's feel to that. close now. Um, just, I'm going to ask you if you have a parting message for our for our viewers, something you'd really like to share from the heart. Uh, yes. No. Absolutely. It's a very beautiful world that we have and never lose hope that the transformation of society is happening. If you look past over the last 150 years, just amazing things have happened. I, I love the, the canal system that goes through Stroud. 200 years ago, we were pulling coal and wool from Wales to get to London. And for pretty much before that, there was all that time when we didn't have any of the things that we have now that make life easy, that we can meditate and take the time to meditate. Uh, a lot of life was survival then. So when people get discouraged about where is, where is the world going, now see the bigger picture. Know that there's amazing things coming for this planet and our humanity holds in, in its heart such an incredible potential. And we're coming to that very quickly. It's maybe a little rough getting there in some ways, but more of your own meditation practice you can do is to stay tuned in and to be in nature, look after your loved ones. Then you'll find that this transition that we're going through on the earth, which is something amazing, will just fulfill things we can't even imagine. Life very soon is going to be so different from anything that we imagined. So. I wish you all the best on that journey. Thank you. Craig, thank you so much. You've shared so much beautiful wisdom, fascinating stories, inspiration, uh, so much richness there for us all. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful to be here and talk with you. Thank you for your wonderful questions. you so much for watching and being with us and join me again on the next Heart to Heart with me Shakti Sundari.